Welcome to the session on green hydrogen decoupling the European energy network. Maybe just the first word, also welcome here to this beautiful building, Palace Residence. This building was um, actually one of the most revolutionary buildings in the 1920s in Brussels because it was built for the uh, richer uh, Brussels people and it was providing all the services uh, to the inhabitants of the luxury apartments. So there was a hairdresser, uh, you could uh, eat in a restaurant. Actually, there was also a gym and even uh, one or two floors down, there was a swimming pool. So very um, forward for that time. And all this was powered by the, uh, one of the first electric power plants in the city in Brussels by coal. And also there was gas on all the floors. So you all know the French word, gas à tous les étages. Um, and of course, uh, that brings me to the topic of today, uh, because now we are about 100 years further, and we see that uh, the comfortable use of these fossil fuels, um, coal and gas, they will be depleted in some decades, uh, but also we see that uh, some people actually, it's not just in the future, some people are suffering today from um, the use of these fuels, and particularly, notably in my country, um, just to see if it works here. Uh, well, this is a picture from Groningen, and actually, even leading up to the Sustainable Energy Week, there were already two earthquakes in Groningen in the past month as um, a consequence of uh, gas, natural gas use. And yeah, this woman, it's not just the inconvenience, it's also in the pockets. Uh, she's lost most of her finances. Uh, all the value of her house is gone. And she's involved in uh, procedures to get damage compensation from the state and uh, uh, all the kind of companies involved in the gas extraction. Another uh, last example, uh, this house was not destructed because of the earthquake, but it was broken down because it was not uh, uh, inhabitable, or not habitable anymore. So yeah, those kind of um, damages sometimes you do not see very well uh, included in calculations or risk assessments of uh, uh, gas products, also for gas transition products. Uh, but this situation only underlines the uh, importance of uh, the topic today Green hydrogen, it can really be a good solution uh, because of its versatility, uh, its applicability to a lot of sectors that at this moment are the cause of a lot of uh, pollution and nuisance. Uh, and today we'll hear a, a, a short overview of the leading products on green hydrogen in Europe. And um, for the second part today, we will discuss uh, their application in the regions and also the barriers and impediments um, to the upscaling of these products and how these uh, barriers can be encountered. I think I've been speaking enough today because there's a couple of things today that's a little challenging. Our session has a lot of speakers, uh, so all the speakers have uh, five minutes, so I also ask the speakers to keep to the time. And uh, also to save some time, uh, you can use Slido for the questions, so continuously you can ask questions. I hope you, you see the... Um, the number from Slido here, and then you have just select the session in the Polak room. And from the interpreters, uh, if somebody needs interpretation, I just have got this also. Uh, so French is on number two, Do German on number three, and English, uh, let's say somebody speaks French here, it's on number four. Uh, yeah, I think I've done with the household remarks. And then I would invite, uh, like to invite uh, the first speaker, Mr. Lionel Boyot. Uh, from the joint product undertaking on fuel cells and hydrogen. Uh, please take the floor. Ladies, gentlemen, uh, good morning. Okay, I do have some slides. Um, how do I move them? Okay, good. So, hydrogen is a gas. It's a gas, and when it is used in a fuel cell, it produces heat and electricity. Hydrogen can be sustainable when it is produced through water electrolysis using electricity coming from renewable sources. I'm working for a public and private partnership called FCAJU that consists of the commission, an industry grouping, and a research grouping. And the aim of this public-private partnership is to bring fuel cells and hydrogen to the point of commercialization. We have been supported nearly 250 projects, that's 800 million euros. And to give you some other figures, 1,400 cars, 300 buses, hundreds of um, micro-combined heat and power units. 
Next slide. And it, the best way to illustrate the um, usefulness of that public and private partnership is looking at the fuel cell bus as a success story. When we go back in time, 2010, some cities would commit to go for these clean, silent, without vibration uh, buses that allow a similar service operation than the current diesel bus. So back in 2010, cities would commit for one, two, five buses maximum, but the price of these buses was still too high. So thanks to the effort of the FCH, further deployment, uh, bigger um, increasing the, the volumes, Today, you could find hydrogen buses below 625,000 euro. It's a division by three over uh, eight years. We have new OEMs involved, different um, types of buses, mini buses, standard one, articulated, double-decker buses. And uh, having done a study about the uh, appetite for fuel cell bus, we noticed that over the next three years, there is an appetite for more than 1,600 buses in Europe. That's a market of 3 billion euro. Now, if I step back a bit, uh, let's think about the Paris Agreement, when the 28 member states and other countries have signed a commitment to limit global warming to two degrees. From that scenario, it means we'll have changed the way we move, the way we transport goods, the way we produce these goods, the way we light and heat our homes. And still, by applying the available technologies today, there is a remaining gap. We, do not, we are not on the path for the two-degree scenario, and hydrogen is needed there. From the gap to reach the two-degree scenario, hydrogen could help with 50% of it, half of it. How? by all these um, activities that you see uh, listed in there. We have developed a strategy for the future for hydrogen, and uh, by 2040, it means hydrogen business will generate 400 billion euro per year, 5 million uh, jobs, and it can represent 25% of the energy demand, total energy demand. Today, the use of hydrogen is still fragmented, but my strongest hope is that it will become widespread and everywhere uh, tomorrow in the near future. Let's think about um, different transport applications. You could today find hydrogen buses, hydrogen cars. Uh, in Paris, for example, you have a taxi fleet with 100 hydrogen taxis around there. Uh, we have forklift trains. You've heard of Alstom in Germany. Um, coaches, e even ships. We are introducing hydrogen and fuel cell into ships. We have projects supporting the deployment of hydrogen and fuel cells in the aviation sector as well. Just, um, I'll do a short comparison. 20 years ago, nobody has a cell phone. 10 years ago, we're happy to be able to make some phone calls and send some text message. And today, everybody has a, um, a mobile phone, a smartphone, and we can no longer operate without our uh, smartphone. To be present everywhere, to be part of our daily life, this is the ambition of hydrogen in the coming 10 to 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel. Then I would like to ask Paul McCormack to take the floor. Or your colleague, I don't know who's first. It's okay, but then we will, I would just suggest that we start with Ms. Ella Stengler from European Association on Waste to Energy. Will the slides appear? I can click on that. That's mine. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, uh, CWEB is a confederation of uh, the operators uh, of waste to energy plants uh, in Europe. So that means they treat the residual waste, which is not good enough for recycling. And rather than landfilling it, which is very bad for the climate, uh, we turn it into energy. 
And uh, in Europe, in the EU28, you have uh, a capacity of about 90 million tons uh, to treat this residual waste in 444 plants in the EU. And uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview, because probably not all of you are familiar with the waste, uh, waste sector, this is um, a waste to energy plant, uh, I think, the pointer does not work. Anyway, it's on the right side. You see on the left side there's a waste delivery, then the orange one is the thermal treatment and the energy generation, and then you see on the right side that's a flue gas cleaning system, which is quite comprehensive uh, and takes a big part of the whole plant, but it's necessary in order to achieve very low emissions and uh, high environmental standards. So uh, waste to energy produces baseload energy, and it's uh, half, half of it is renewable energy. It depends always on the waste input, but um, there is biodegradable parts in, in the waste, and so it produces, uh, it's bio, considered biomass, so it produces half uh, of its energy is, is, is renewable. And so um, it, uh, it is baseload because it runs 24 hours a day, 365 uh, days per year. Uh, and it produces enough uh, um, electricity to supply um, 18 million people with, uh, with electricity, and about 15 million uh, inhabitants can be supplied with heat from the waste that is uh, turned into energy from European waste to energy plants. And it also of course, replaces then fossil fuels because the energy doesn't need to be produced by using fossil fuels. And that can save between 10 and 50 million tons of CO2 equivalents, depending which fossil fuels you depend, uh, you replace. Additionally, there's a leftover from the combustion process that's the bottom ash. And the bottom ash also contains materials that can be used, for example, uh, metals uh, that can be recycled from the bottom ash, and that also saves uh, CO2. One ton of um, metals that are recycled from bottom ash can save two tons of CO2. And from the mineral part, which is left in the bottom ash, you can produce uh, bricks like the one here you see on the right side. No, I, I, cannot, I cannot use a pointer. So you see it here on the right side. That's, for example, a Rotterdam brick that's made from bottom ash and it's used in road construction. So there's also some material recovery from the leftover from waste to energy. And now I come to the topic of today. How, what has waste to energy to do uh, with hydrogen? So actually, we produce uh, energy in the waste to energy plant, and if there is a, a, a peak, for example, there are a lot of renewables in, in the grid, what do you do with the excess uh, electricity? In this case, if you cannot deliver it to, to the grid, and also additionally, you of course, use, uh, you, you, um, you supply the district heating and cooling net, or you, you provide process steam to the nearby industry, but uh, the part that you produce uh, in or supply with, with, with electricity and want to put in the grid, you know if there are peaks, the grid doesn't, is not so keen on your electricity, so you have to do something with it. And uh, a good solution could be to, put, um, uh, to, to power an electrolyzer with the excess energy from the waste to energy plant, and the electrolyzer produces uh, hydrogen. And uh, then from this, you can, for example, fuel public transport or waste trucks um, in a quite environmentally sound way. It's, it's, it's silent, uh, it, it's uh, emission-free, this, this transport. And uh, this is actually, or will be very soon, practiced in Wuppertal, that's a city in Germany. Um, the Wuppertal Waste to Energy plant, uh, uh, or the, the owners of the plant, they have ordered 10 buses, fuel cell buses, and they will be fueled by hydrogen powered by the waste to energy plant. So a bus needs uh, 40 kilograms of hydrogen per day. They produce 400 kilograms of hydrogen per day to supply the 10 buses. And they will start just now, in the third quarter, quarter of 2019. And I think it's the first one, at least from our membership that I'm aware of, it's the first project that a waste to energy operator uh, produces the hydrogen and fuels uh, cities, buses uh, with uh, this hydrogen. 
And the project is included within the Jive initiative, aiming to reduce also the market price because uh, uh, the uh, economies matter as well and the performance of the fuel cells vehicles. Uh, another case is the Revive project that was launched in 2018, aiming to reduce also the price and increase the operational knowledge of fuel cell powered heavy duty vehicles. And the vehicle and fuel cells uh, manufacturers joined to provide 15 fuel cell waste collection trucks to seven cities. And such vehicles have the potential to reduce the pollution and the noise of our cities. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for sticking to the time. So then I would like to invite Paul Mocker to give his presentation. Yes, please take a seat. We wait first for a second for the presentation to come up. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and very guests. We're speaking today on the GenCom project, which is about uh, protecting energy secure communities for remote communities, using, using hydrogen from curtailed energy to promote renewable energy for uh, curtailed uh, communities. The motivation for the GenCom project, we have a lot of renewable energy in Western Europe, especially in Ireland, and curtailment is a problem. Well, you're not, not using the energy for the purpose it's intended for, and you're wasting it. One of the large companies in our project, funded under, under Interreg Northwest Europe, is Viridian. They have 20 wind farms, and until last year, they were getting paid for curtailed energy. That has now stopped, so there's now an economic driver to motivate the GenCom project. And we're looking to use that wind energy, solar energy in Germany, and bioenergy in Scotland to promote opportunities for communities that are at the end of the supply chain, energetically remote, to become energy secure. And by becoming energy secure, they're now in control of their own destiny and being able to use the green hydrogen, which is zero carbon footprint compared with other uses of hydrogen. Our vision across the, the 10 partners in the five countries are the three hydrogen pilots. The wind to energy in Ireland, the solar to energy in Germany and the bio to energy in Scotland. Three different sizes of renewable energies, three different projects, three different uses. And as we move forward, we see that the projects then, through using electrolysis, using the handing to meet the energy demands in Northern Ireland, in Germany and in Scotland, where we're using it for different purposes, for mobility, for heat, for transport and for balancing the grid. So you're looking to use how green hydrogen becomes the energy vector of the future. It's not going to be one size fits all. Europe's energy needs and energy demands dictated by grid saturation, dictated by grid opportunities, allow hydrogen then to be that vector to carry energy forward to meet the CO2 reduction demands that we face. Our deliverables, the decision support tool to allow communities, companies, individuals, and public authorities to make informed decisions based on fact, based on data, and not based on assumptions. And then the community hires informed to allow those communities to take charge of their own energy future, to allow those communities to start making decisions how to move forward. How can we can reduce how hydrogen makes sense as part of an energy solution? As I said, it's not going to be one size fits all, but hydrogen is a catalyst in the middle there that allows us to overcome the grid saturation. In Ireland at the minute, we can connect no more renewables because the grid can't take it. The grid flows strongly from east to west, but the renewables are the opposite west to east. So we're looking to reverse the supply chain in energy and open the opportunities for renewables, for industry, for mobility, for heat, from AD, from solar, and from wind. And as we said, that community hydrogen forum gives people the information, the data, to make informed decisions not based on assumptions, but based on fact. Not just fact from Ireland, but fact from across Europe. Thank you. Uh, please, you can sit in the panel. Uh, Paul? Um, yes, so then I would like to invite the next uh, presenter, Dr. Antonio Lopez Nicolas, uh, from the European Commission, Deputy Head of Unit from the Energy Union. So, good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for the 
invitation. I don't have slides, so I'm going to try to speak five minutes and, and leave some time for um, discussion. I'm going to focus on, on three points. Um, the long-term decarbonization strategy, the renewables directive, and uh, a few final words on sector coupling, sector integration, why this is uh, important. So as many of you know, the Commission uh, adopted its long-term strategy uh, last November, um, examining cost-efficient pathways uh, towards uh, climate neutrality by 2050, in line with the Paris Agreement. So that long-term strategy goal is not to identify a single pathway or propose uh, a single scenario, but to identify possible pathways to achieve uh, that goal. So in the scenarios we have identified in those that uh, aim at keeping global warming uh, below uh, two degrees, uh, the use of gases is uh, roughly half um, compared by today if uh, the uh, use of hydrogen does not develop because lack of uh, consumption uh, market. In a context where large scale uh, end uses of hydrogen would take place, then the uh, total consumption of renewable gases would stay uh, at the same level, roughly at the same level than today. So if we go to the scenarios aiming at limit global warming at 1.5 degrees, the uh, consumption of gaseous fuels would drop by roughly one-third compared to uh, today's figures, uh, with uh, only uh, about one-fifth of today's natural gas consumption uh, remaining. So in that context, we can uh, see that the long-term strategy sees a clear potential for the production of large quantities of hydrogen from renewable sources, but at the end, it's, of course, uh, dependent on the uptake for final use across different sectors. But we are not starting from scratch uh, for the long-term strategy. Uh, we, uh, Council and Parliament, adopted the uh, revised renewables directive uh, last December. And of course, the, the Renewables Directive is uh, supportive of uh, the deployment of uh, renewable gases, and it considers that they have uh, an important role to play in the uh, achievement of the at least 32% uh, percent renewables target by um, 2030. Uh, it's not only that, of course, renewable gases uh, play an important role also for uh, security of supply and, and, and for uh, a number of other elements. So apart from this 32% uh, renewables target in the overall energy consumption, the uh, renewables directive have two uh, sector specific targets that aim uh, to promote the decarbonization of uh, the heating and cooling and the transport sectors, where, of course, renewable gases are um, supposed to play an important part of it. For the heating and cooling sector, there is uh, an indicative target of 1.3% increase of, um, of renewable share in the heating and cooling uh, sector, uh, which of course uh, could be uh, met through uh, renewable gases, um, including hydrogen. And then uh, a sector-specific target of 14% for uh, the transport sector, uh, with a 3.5 uh, sub-target for advanced biofuels. And there, I mean, biomethane, but also uh, hydrogen, uh, included in the renewable uh, fuels of a non-biological origin can play a very important role. So we are not starting from, 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 from scratch. So hydrogen and, and renewable gases are already part of the uh, solution in uh, Europe's uh, decarbonization agenda. We are trying 
obviously to uh, push things uh, to the next step, sector coupling, uh, understanding sector coupling, the coupling of the gas and the electricity sectors and, and sector integration, the integration of the electricity sector with hard to decarbonize sectors, such as the heating and cooling, the transport, the industry, the agriculture sector, are uh, extremely uh, important uh, to uh, achieve uh, climate neutrality and to uh, decarbonize the uh, energy um, sector in a cost-efficient way, as well as to uh, allow uh, for a further integration of uh, renewable electricity in the electricity grids, uh, providing additional flexibility. So, Obviously, we welcome efforts to foster sector coupling and integration, uh, both by what we call uh, direct electrification, but also by what we call indirect electrification, where uh, indirect carriers such as hydrogen uh, can play an important role. So that's all I wanted to say for, for the introduction, and um, I welcome very much to, uh, to stay for uh, the rest of the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we have time for just some very short uh, questions. I see that Slido here is on my right. Um, two questions. Maybe the first one is that for Ella. Yeah, maybe for Ella or for Paul. In Ireland, in Ireland, the, the waste is used to produce electricity in both summer and winter, but the challenge is to get the balance, especially if you're working with anaerobic digestion. There are a lot of anaerobic digesters in Ireland based on farms, so they have a constant feedstock, and it's maintaining that constant feedstock to be able to give you the electricity output you need. Uh, in the rest of Europe, the, the balance would change with the feedstock, and therefore they have to manage that. But I know at home, the electricity winter and summertime would have, a, would have the same balance from the waste. Um, most of the European waste to energy plants operate CHP, so combined heat and power. So they uh, produce the heat or cooling. So, uh, of course, you have in, in uh, more southern European countries, you have uh, less demand for heat than in northern Europeans, but you could do cooling. And if there's less need, then, of course, you can uh, turn it into electricity. But in order to be flexible and to, to, to give a service also to the electricity grid, which can be overloaded during peak times, then, for example, the hydrogen could be a, a good solution to, to serve uh, the flexi flexibility and serve um, uh, the electricity grid, so that uh, demand matches, uh, supply matches uh, demand. I don't know if this answers the question, but uh, if not, please, Clara, please come to me back. Okay. You on, want to say something more? On the, on the green ammonia question, my colleague uh, Kevin Verslein from VUB here in Brussels is working on a strand of that from waste hydrogen, from the renewable hydrogen. So Anna, who asked the question, you can see Kevin later on. The question will be answered later. There is one other. Well, we do not have much time, actually. Maybe we take the first one. If hydrogen we produce via electrolysis with the immense amount of water, where the water come from? What about water availability for people? One of our partners in Ensa Rua in France is looking at using wastewater from the sewage systems to go through the electrolysis. So it helps actually answer two problems. One is handling waste, and the second is using water. So therefore, you're looking at different opportunities for the green hydrogen. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have the time, uh, I would like to go to the next uh, part of this uh, meeting, uh, the panel sessions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the panel, um, this first panel was. Um, so then I would like to invite uh, Jorgo Schatzimarkakis to take the floor, who has been a European Parliament member for 10 years and is now Secretary General of uh, Hydrogen Europe. And uh, he will also be the moderator for the other um, panel sessions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good morning. Um, 
We have heard a lot about waste, waste electricity, waste to be used. Um, and our role in um, Hydrogen Europe is also to provide policymakers. We have uh, well, I heard one policymaker this morning with what you can do in case of curtailment. That's a, that's a word that had, has been mentioned several times this morning. And just to give you a figure to imagine how big the curtailment is, take Germany, which is a country that started quite early with renewable energy. Last year, Germany had a curtailment in the value of 1.4 billion. So 1.4 billion of euro were paid by consumers of electricity because of the feed-in tariff system. And it was not put into their grid because the grid was too small. And this is where hydrogen jumps in. In milliseconds, an electrolyzer can, can turn on. Um, the dispatchability of this electrolyzer is very high. We will listen to a presentation on this uh, during the next panel. And then you produce this gas. Lionel said it with a very first word. It's a gas. And you transport the gas in a pipeline. This is a hydrogen pipeline. I'll give it round so you can see it's polyethylene in the middle, carbon fiber that keeps pressure up to 200 bar possible in this pipeline, and another polyethylene to protect it from sun. You can put it into the desert. The Arabs, Saudi Aramco, is buying exactly that here to produce hydrogen because they start to produce a lot of electricity and they use this hydrogen to be sent to Europe. Give it round here. I want this back in the end of the meeting. Now, hydrogen is there, hopefully, if it is produced. But to be honest, what was said now in the first panel, we need deep decarbonization. So we need a lot of hydrogen. Where does it come from? Curtainment is one option. To be honest, it's not enough. I already alluded to sun-flooded areas that can produce a lot of hydrogen. But waste and the possibilities to use waste is another option. Yesterday I had a fascinating uh, a professor from uh, the University of Kyoto in my office and he presented to me a Japanese project of plastic to hydrogen. Plastic, another big, big global problem. And here he said the Chinese are not taking the plastic of Europeans anymore. So we take in Japan and the company that is doing it is huge, hugely busy at the moment because they have a lot to do. Now, that's why I'm very curious myself to the next panel, because I will learn a lot, like you will, because we will have experts um, from the different fields. I say the names and, of course, your company. I'm not going through the bio. You can find the bio online. So everything, we are very modern here, so it's online. But I would like to invite uh, Alexis Thio. Uh, he's the policy officer from ESWET which is the European Supplies of Waste to Energy Technology. If you wish, you can just come up and uh, to the stage and take your seat. Uh, then, Terve Terve, Tuomas Hakkala, Finnish uh, guy. He is uh, from Convion Oil. He's the co-founder of Convion Oil. He commercializes solid oxide fuel cell systems and is active in wastewater management. So he will answer one of the questions that has been raised. Redstack. That's the company represented by Dr. Peter Hack. It's a blue energy company. Uh, then we have uh, from the University of Palermo, uh, Professor Giorgio Michale, who is here. There he is. Um, and he is an expert in the sustainable use of seawater. Because there was the question, where does the water come from? That guy can answer these questions because he's an expert in desalination. And... Last but not least, Dr. Arnaud Roulon. He's a researcher from uh, IFER, which is uh, uh, a joint research group uh, from EDF and the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And he is a, an expert in electrolyzers. Electrolyzers, that's the, the, the technology that we need in order to produce the hydrogen and to balance the power grid. As we said, 1.4 billion only in Germany. You need somebody to balance it, and the electrolyzers can do. And that's why I'm looking forward to your presentation. But we start with your presentation. You want to stand up? You want to sit? It's up to you. I can stay there. You can you stay can there. Start. So Alexis uh, from Yusef. I don't have the pointer. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. But I don't have many slides anyway, so <laughs> thank you. 
So, uh, yeah, I speak on behalf of my, of my president, uh, who, is, uh, who was uh, unfortunately not able to, to uh, make it today. I want to um, be very short, highlight just a few points to try to convince you that uh, waste to energy is actually a very good medium to um, uh, disseminate hydrogen a bit more. Uh, I, I will rely on the three words that Mr. Lopez from the Commission said. Uh, I think uh, you highlighted decarbonization, renewables and sector coupling. And I think those three uh, keywords uh, uh, apply uh, ideally to, um, uh, to waste to energy and, and hydrogen. So uh, in a nutshell, I, I just want to, to present our association, which is the uh, European uh, suppliers of waste to energy technology. So the main objective of this association is to uh, promote at the EU level uh, the, the knowledge uh, and, and the, the technologies of uh, our members, which are displayed there. And uh, uh, how do we do that? Uh, mostly by, by raising awareness uh, of the positive implications uh, that uh, waste energy has uh, in terms of uh, better waste management, um, uh, enhanced resource recovery, and environmental protection. Uh, I will shortly mention waste management because this is our core uh, um, field of uh, uh, this is our core field uh, our objective is to uh, address to treat the residual waste so the waste that cannot be recycled uh, and um, uh, basically in a more and more resource efficient economy we want to make use of the resources that are currently going to landfills so we want to prevent waste going to landfills but we want also to foster quality recycling. So we want to take the residues from re recycling and uh, address them in our waste to energy plants. So waste to energy is a public service which is complementary to a resource efficient economy. And we also promote resource recovery. Um, more and more in waste to energy plants, it's not about just burning the waste, uh, as you uh, may think, but it's also about uh, recovering uh, ashes, making new products, uh, it's uh, about producing energy, it's about producing electricity and heat. Uh, so uh, we, 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 we can uh, produce a lot of resources uh, from, uh, from, from waste to energy. And uh, this is in line perfectly with the decarbonization objectives of the Commission, uh, because not only uh, with our more efficient processes, we are able to decarbonize our own sector, the waste to energy sector, but we also offset carbon emissions from other sectors. So if you divert waste from landfills to waste to energy, you prevent methane emissions, uh, so you prevent uh, more potent greenhouse gases from being emitted. If you build a waste to energy plant to have this public service of treating residual waste. It's a power plant with fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuels that you won't build because you are able to produce energy from a waste to energy plant. Uh, and of course, with the bottom ashes, uh, you can uh, basically replace primary raw materials that you would have to extract and then you would have to consume emissions for that purpose. So what we decarbonize a lot of sectors actually, and we, now could be able to decarbonize one more sector, which is transport. Because apparently, and uh, I, I, I must say that I'm aware of this topic since not a long time, but waste energy is a perfect medium okay. to disseminate uh, hydrogen and to work together with hydrogen. Because the, 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 the technical potential of a waste energy plant is such, it uh, generates heat, it generates electricity, so it's ready for the kind of next generation uh, hydrogen production plants, which will work uh, on high, uh, um, high, high heat. Uh, so will be more efficient and will be able to uh, to produce even more hydrogen. Um, one one example I, I have a study in mind which I read recently. It's an old one. It's a French one, and uh, it well ten years ago. And uh, uh, the, the conclusion of the study is that if you use the waste that you currently divert to landfills in France, this waste, which is combustible, which could be in used in waste to energy plants instead, you would be able to feed, if you use the high, uh, the high temperature uh, electrolysis technology, you would be able to make 30 million cars run on the roads in France. So 
it's theoretical. It would mean that you use the whole uh, energy of the plant for hydrogen production, but it has a massive potential. Um, five, you reach five minutes. I reach five minutes. Three, three conclusions. Uh, I, I want you, if there are three things I want you to, to bring back home today, is uh, first that uh, waste to energy has a huge technical potential to, uh, um, uh, to work uh, with hydrogen. Uh, it also has ready, readily available consumers. If you take, for example, waste collection trucks, if you retrofit them with hydrogen, then uh, they don't have to uh, go to a gas station anymore. They don't have to be fed with electricity, with very heavy batteries. Um, so that's, that's the first point. Technology, uh, the waste energy technology is fit for hydrogen production. Second thing, it has to be uh, encouraged by, by uh, the public sector. So at the moment, there's an evaluation of the state aid schemes, uh, uh, yeah, the European state aid schemes. So power to gas is something that should be looked at, I believe, uh, in the evaluation of the state aid schemes. And the last thing, uh, I forgot about it. Yes, uh, local authorities should be involved from the very beginning of the projects because it's quite land intensive, those hydrogen production plants. So uh, we have to make sure that land is also available uh, locally uh, to, to, to foster this technology. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Indeed, I have to say that uh, local authorities and regional and the European authorities are very interested in hydrogen at the moment. There is a bottleneck in some member states. So, so some are very, very advanced, like Netherlands. Uh, Finland has still a way to go, and that's why I'm looking forward to Thomas' uh, presentation. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Thomas Hakala. I'm a co-founder of Cornvion, and I'm uh, happy to tell you today about the role of fuel cells in using biogas, and more particularly about our European project called DEMO SOFC. The acronym SOFC stands for Solid Oxide Fuel Cell. It's one of the subcategories of fuel cells. Um, considering the magnitude of issues that we're trying to solve, um, I also want to, in my presentation, introduce the, the question of scale. Which, scale. which technology fits into which scale? That, that is uh, quite important when it comes to modular technologies such as uh, fuel cells and, and electrochemical systems tend to be. Um, few things about Convion. Um, we are a young startup with a fairly long history. The core team has its roots in Vertila Corporation. We started activities in 2002. Convion was established and started operation in 2013. Throughout all these years, we focused on large fuel cell systems, systems technologies and product development um, with solid oxide fuel cell technology uh, uh, at the heart of the system. Our product is a 50 to 60 kilowatt modular mini cogeneration power plant. 50 to 60 because of the reason that we work with different suppliers of cell stacks and they have different characteristics. Our systems can flexibly use natural gas, biomethane, biogas, or to some extent also hydrogen in power generation, produce zero emissions. And the first of our systems has been in operation at the uh, at north of Italy at, at the wastewater treatment facility fueled by biogas. Uh, decentralization is one of the big themes and, and transitions ongoing and we believe that alongside with the non-dispatchable renewables, uh, uh, continuously operating dependable uh, fuel cells have a role and uh, they, they become an essential uh, part of the technology mix. You can co-locate fuel cells uh, with con consumers of electricity and improve the overall efficiency. But you can also co-locate co these systems uh, with uh, local sources of fuel, such as biogas. Uh, this is a very simplified illustration of a concept of Demosoft. This is an actual wastewater treatment facility uh, outside of Turin in Italy. Uh, it has a load input of 180,000 population equivalent. They have a stringent water cleaning uh, process and the sludges go into anaerobic digestion. That's a bacterial process producing biogas with 60 plus percent methane in it. We remove sulfur and siloxanes that are in the ga gas and then the gas is good to go to power generation. Uh, this is an old and not so optimized facility, but we reached approximately 100% thermal self-sufficiency 
and then the 174 kilowatt of electricity will go into the, uh, powering the systems of the facility. In European con context, this is a medium-sized, and even in global context, this is a medium-sized facility. There are hundreds of similar systems, and actually, if you look, majority of wastewater in Europe is treated in small-scale facilities where power production penetration is very low for the reasons and that alternative uh, the technologies such as piston engines or uh, turbines would have a very low efficiency. It wouldn't make them feasible at all. Also, biomethane production in small scale doesn't make sense. And this is the reason why I want to talk about the scale. Uh, fuel cell technology, a modular technology, extends the range where we can uh, utilize the embedded energy in uh, uh, waste and uh, offset use of fossil uh, fuels uh, significantly. You have another minute to go. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I thought uh, that would take a longer time. Uh, so this is an actual uh, view of the, uh, the facility. The third, one, uh, third module is still to come. And uh, it is, uh, it's been a very tremendous opportunity for us to learn about uh, the needs and requirements of industrial scale uh, biogas facilities. And uh, we're going to uh, reproduce. This is a replicable, uh, globally replicable uh, application of this technology. Okay. Thank you. Let's come to Peter now. He comes from uh, the Netherlands, like Frank, the, uh, our initial speaker and host. Uh, this is a country that we heard about the earthquakes is a little bit under pressure to change dramatically, and they do. They have a hydrogen special envoy, so it's the first government in Europe to have a special government envoy on hydrogen. And they're really, really, uh, well, speedy, uh, putting pressure on the other European member states. Peter, you have the floor. Good morning. Let me give you a little update on the uh, blue energy technology based on a reversed electrodialysis. Uh, I'll explain the technology later. But uh, as a start, when it would be fully implemented on a worldwide basis, uh, the technology could uh, produce up to 13% of the global uh, um, uh, electricity demand or an equivalent amount of uh, hydrogen. Comparing to the Dutch situation, it would be 1,750 megawatt that can be installed or 1.6 billion cubic meters of hydrogen each year, plus some oxygen. The technology works 24-7, full continuous, as long as the river flows into the sea. Uh, so it is a big, great contribution to the grid stability and the base load. Where is the technology coming from? Uh, since 2004, at the Wetzes Institute in Leeuwarden, Netherlands, at least three PhDs on a continuous base are working uh, on it. Um, in 2011, some milestones were achieved, so we uh, started to build a pilot plant. The pilot plant was commissioned in 2014, a total capex of 5 million euro treating the fresh water uh, from the Waddenzee and the salt water, sorry, the fresh water from the IJssel Lake and the salt water from the Waddenzee. And our King Willem Alexander uh, gave us the honor to come and open uh, the plant at the end of 2014. In 2016, the full uh, Dutch government awarded us the status of a Dutch national icon, indicating that they think it's an innovative technology, it's sustainable technology, and it's uh, also creating export potential for the Netherlands. But the word sustainable, I think, is the most important at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we are adjusting uh, the technology or stacks not to only in, uh, produce electricity, <coughs> but also to produce direct hydrogen and oxygen out of water electrolysis. Um, how does the technology work? We are using fresh water and uh, salt water, river water and sea water, and two types of membranes, ion uh, selective membranes, one passing the positive ions, the other one passing the negative ions. Um, and per membrane, in this case, you can generate some 50 millivolts of uh, uh, power, of potential. When you make a stack of 2,000 membranes, alternating the two types of uh, membranes, alternating the fresh salt, fresh water flow through the, the spaces between the membranes, you generate some uh, 100 volt of uh, DC. That is for electricity production. But when you uh, would change the setup of the electrolyzer using the same pretreatment, the same water, 
uh, the same type of membranes, the same hydraulics, but only 50 membranes per uh, set, cre uh, creating about two and a half volts. That's just enough to split water and to make uh, oxygen and hydrogen directly, without first harvesting the electricity, but you have a direct uh, production of the hydrogen. Um, on top of that, if there would be some surplus uh, electricity on the public net, because maybe there's a lot of wind or a lot of sunshine, you can add extra uh, current into the electrolyzer, into the RAD stack, to uh, s uh, boost the production of hydrogen. So you do not need extra hydrolyzers. Uh, uh, you can immediately uh, put it into the RAD stack. So far, it all works on uh, the pilot plant, as uh, shown on the previous picture. And now we are heading for uh, upscaling. And we are tending to build a 0.75 uh, megawatt uh, power plant uh, as a demonstration project at the, at the coast in the Netherlands. And I hope to be able to invite you in a couple of years to uh, come and look at our showcase. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So you use salt water and uh, fresh water, and this is exactly the issue salt water of uh, Professor Giorgio Michale from uh, University of Palermo. So uh, we are interested in what you do in order to clean up water or to make water usable for electrolysis. Yes, in fact, what uh, was just uh, presented a moment ago, I think is uh, very interesting to put into the broader framework of the circular economy and the sustainability issue that we are facing at the moment. So the use of uh, seawater in a sustainable uh, pattern um, would uh, result in the production of fresh water for the population wherever it is needed, especially in the Mediterranean basin. Uh, at the same time, whenever you talk about desalination processes, there are big issues. One issue is related to the uh, uh, energy uh, demand for the desalination processes, as well as the environmental impact of the brine that is generated together with the fresh water, and you have uh, uh, to uh, deal with this problem. So, um, if we uh, take into account all these uh, aspects and we start what we call uh, a circular pattern, then uh, we could end up with uh, a number of achievements and uh, a greater, uh, greater level of sustainability. In this respect, if we start from seawater and we uh, use a desalination process to produce fresh water, we can uh, uh, then use brine for example, to recover uh, uh, raw materials, it could be table salt, could be other minerals, maybe strategic minerals, could be magnesium, lithium, or other minerals. At the very end of this process, you end up with, you know, brines, uh, which is still rich uh, in terms of salinity content, and in this respect, uh, a reverse electrodialysis, a salinity gradient technology can be implemented in order to uh, recover energy, I mean, to convert this salinity gradient into uh, electricity. Uh, at the very same time, and actually, uh, we've, been, uh, uh, we've been involved in a number of European projects uh, as far as uh, salinity gradient energy uh, is concerned. Um, well, uh, we have come up with this problem of, let's say, it was considered at that time as a side effect, the production of, of hydrogen in the electrodic compartments of this uh, uh, reverse electrodialysis uh, unit. But now, as it has been shown, this can be an opportunity. I mean, salinity gradient technology can offer an alternative route, and this is mostly important, I think, to highlight today, uh, for uh, uh, hydrogen uh, generation. And uh, I would also add something. Uh, about the versatility of salinity gradient technology, in particular reverse electrodialysis uh, technology. Um, I mean, reverse electrodialysis can be arranged in a variety of configuration. It could be open loop configuration, the one that uh, was presented a moment ago, but could be even implemented uh, on a closed loop arrangement, which means that you can use, for example, waste it from the industry, and you can even uh, combine the use of waste heat from the industry with waste stream from the industry. You can think of waste acid, 
that can be uh, fed in the uh, uh, electrodic compartment, uh, in the cathodic compartment of a red cell to generate hydrogen. So you can reach hydrogen production by combining all these things, uh, reaching a higher level of you know, sustainability of the overall uh, uh, process. So I believe this is important to say that at the very end, you can uh, uh, basically configure uh, these processes in such a way that uh, you uh, will generate uh, many, uh, let's say, you, you will get many results by just configuring, a, a, let's say, the industrial process with a li um, higher level of integration. So I think it is very important not to separate processes, not just to go along, let's say, the linear approach, but just try uh, to configure things with a higher degree of integration between processes, and in such way you can achieve better That's results. So, hope. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> so that's very important, because we have learned now that you can produce hydrogen uh, in a different perspective from the usual way of thinking, which is electrolyzers, we'll come to that, which is using power grid or non-using power grid, but having the direct connection to the production of renewable energy. But I mentioned that because we, as the hydrogen people, have a lot of, <clears throat> uh, we face a lot of anxiety of grid users, power grid users, because they say, don't touch our power grid. We have already a very stressed grid. If you use our power for your hydrogen, we cannot, we cannot do the decarbonization. It's a misconception. Uh, and that is what we want. We are very grateful also that uh, during that uh, week of uh, sustainable energy, uh, we can convey clearly the message that we want to help the power grid. We don't want to stress it. We want to balance it. How this works is uh, dealt with also by Arnaud, um, because electrolyzers have the possibility to do so. You are working for both the German uh, Research Institute, but also ODF, one of the biggest producers of power. <coughs> and lately, <coughs> uh, a member of Hydrogen Europe now, lately, very interested in, in hydrogen as well, which is very, very good. You have the floor. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Arno Roulan, and I'm working at IFER. So IFER stands for European Institute for Energy Research. And it is a collaboration between the French as uh, a German uh, university KIT, so Council for Institute for Technology, and the French electricity provider, EDF. So we are about 100 researchers uh, working at IFER on different uh, topics related to sustainability. And one of them is uh, hydrogen production. So we try to assess for our main client, EDF, what is the potential of hydrogen market in the near future since hydrogen is highly carbonized at the moment, I mean, hydrogen production comes mostly from steam methane reforming. 95% of the production comes from steam methane reforming. This means fossil energy. So we believe there is a, an alternative based on water electrolysis, so using water and electricity from the grid to produce either green hydrogen or low carbon uh, hydrogen, depending on the energy mix. We are also working at the same time on several European projects, and one of them is a Hydrogen Mobility Europe, introduced by Lionel Boyo at the beginning of this session. And I'm leading a work package that aims to evaluate the flexibility of the electrolyzer. But not only the electrolyzer, but the raw refueling station. Because a refueling station with production on site, there is different components. There is the electrolyzer, but all the auxiliary system. This means the water pumps. This means a compressor. This means a storage, high pressure storage, low pressure storage. And this has an impact. And you were right, actually, Giorgio. The stack is able to answer within one second. No matter the technology, we've got different technology, PEM technology, alkaline technology. But both technology can answer within one second. But after we've got all the integration of the electrolyzer, but also, as I mentioned, the auxiliary system, the water pump. We cannot shut down the water pump. We cannot shut down the storage. So this has an impact. And we, are, we try to evaluate what are the impact by doing such balancing services, try to get uh, low electricity prices. And I mean, it, it's not that easy, because we have to bring around the table different expertise, uh, the manufacturer with the electrolyzer, the refilling station, the TSO, an aggregator, and 
in the end, we've got the end consumer that he co is going to come to refuel his car, hydrogen car, bus, and he wants that when he comes, the hydrogen is there. And it's kind of tricky because, I mean, it's still a lot of investment. And what is the, what is the cost of oversizing the, the storage? What is the cost of, because we have, you, have to, sorry, you have to answer some balancing services within one second. And if you cannot provide these balancing services, then you've got a fine. And what is the cost of the fine? and the storage capacity, oversizing, and so on, and it's, it's not that easy. And you were saying that uh, balancing services can provide over 1 billion euro. It is true, but it's really, really short time. If you take the example of Kiel, they installed a new gas turbine. I think it was about over 10 megawatt in the north of Germany, just to provide electricity services. But it's really on a few seconds, a few minutes per year because you've got the electricity prices increased to up to 1,000 euro per megawatt hours and after decreasing. So it, it's really, really complex and that's something we try to evaluate. Um, maybe I can leave some time for the question, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> maybe uh, the second question uh, is already going to you. What are the power? But read out the question. And I would like to uh, allude to one very concrete example uh, that is the uh, energy park in Mainz. There you have six windmills generating six megawatt of electricity. And you have a PEM electrolyzer mm -hmm. that reacts in milliseconds in two cases. First case, the power grid of the utility of Mainz is full. So the system can detect it and say, I switch from power into the grid to power into the electrolyzer. The electrolyzer turns on Im Im immediately. Uh, the second is the price of electricity is extremely low. Mm. So sometimes when there is no demand on electricity, price is very low. The system knows this and the electrolyzer goes on. Now what does the electrolyzer do with the hydrogen produced? Two options. First option, it goes into a storage. It is stored in cylinders that then go to fueling stations. Second option, very interesting, it's directly connected with the gas grid. And it produces the hydrogen, which is then injected into the gas grid. You have different regulations in different member states, how much of percentage of hydrogen you can inject. Um, and in Germany, uh, it gives more energy, more energy to the system, and it makes it more renewable, if you wish. So it's very interesting. Uh, I've brought some members of parliament to that uh, facility and I couldn't get rid of them because they wanted to stay, to stay there. So it's very, very fascinating. It's remotely handled from Erlangen. So it's, it's not nobody there. So it's wow. Now, did you read the question yeah. and can you answer it? So what are the power energy demands of uh, hydrogen electrolysis? Yeah. Are they adequate to provide? Of course, I, I cannot answer like that. I'm a researcher, so it depends on the capacity you install. And, but Maybe about the operational strategies, there are the spot prices that change every hour, that fluctuates a lot. So there is some operational strategies that we could do by tackling low prices. So that's the first optimization. And the second one is the grid balancing services. And there is a huge competition on these services. That's something I did not mention in my presentation. There is a huge competition with electric vehicle, with battery, with gas turbine, as I mentioned, in the north of Germany. There is a huge competition, and each year, these balancing services prices decrease. So that's why we try to, it, it's not easy to enter this market. So, and battery is more mature at the moment than uh, hydrogen. So that's why we, we are looking at this option, but it should not be considered as the first option. I think the first option is first, to look at the spot prices and optimizing depending on the electricity prices. There is also another topic that is taxes. The taxes, grid taxes, depend sometime on the, on the time. So in the morning, it can be more expensive than at the midnight and so on. So there is also a second optimization on the taxes. And something else is when you do balancing services, I mean, the manufacturer cannot guarantee the quality or the efficiency of the stack during 10 years of doing such kind of flexibility. So there is really a big 
this is a big topic that we try to, to analyze. And we, I cannot provide, unfortunately, uh, an, an answer like that. Um, don't know whether somebody else wants to answer. Uh, I, I, I try to say one word. In a world with ever more renewable energy, the volatility becomes an issue. So you need to answer. If you get out of nuclear, out of coal, out of oil, out of gas, you're only in a renewable world, you need this dispatchability, this answer in milliseconds. However, if it's for a day, battery or flywheels are an option. Uh, pump hydro, wonderful option for countries like uh, Norway or Austria. For the Netherlands, flat country, no option because you have no mountain. So there you need to talk about seasonal storage. And seasonal storage is something where at the moment there's only one solution that is affordable for huge amounts of seasonal storage, that's hydrogen, that can be then stored in the gas grid or in salt coverings and other coverings. There's a second question, then I think we need to change the panel because uh, but I inherited, inherited already uh, some delay. Uh, there's the question how to bring down the price of green hydrogen. And here there's a relation, uh, electrolyzer costs 12 euro per kilo, while the mentioned, you mentioned already, uh, the methane reformed hydrogen costs only 2 euro per kilo. You're all nodding. Uh, I can tell you that the Saudi Aramco CTO that I met some, some months ago uh, on the, the question, how much do I pay for your green hydrogen? Do you produce green hydrogen? He said, yes. <laughs> you can have blue for $1.25, blue hydrogen, which is carbon capture sequestration. I, I'm not going into that technology now. You can have green for $1.80. Wow. I said, why? <laughs> I can produce electricity for less than two cent kilowatt hour. And the 80%, that's what we all know, 80% of the costs of hydrogen, green hydrogen, are related to the electricity price. Only 20% at the moment are related to the electrolyzer. These guys here are working hard on making electrolyzers cheaper, but the main point is electricity. That's what makes up the price. And then, of course, how to transport the hydrogen cheaply in a pipeline or a little bit more expensive with vessels, with trailers, um, and that's, that makes then, in the end, the... The, the price. Is there a slide or question? Any other question? Two, two polls coming up next. Two polls coming up next. Okay. So while I invite uh, the panelists to take their seats, and thanks very much. <laughs> a big hand. I would invite uh, the next panelist, pardon, <laughs> uh, Eric from uh, NG. Stefan from Toyota, Rory from the National University of Ireland, and Kevin from the Freie Universität Brüssel uh, to take uh, your seat, wherever you want. Ah, you need to get your microphone, okay. Uh, so, there's a poll, uh, and we can explain. As we change over panels, we're going to put up a couple of polls, but all of the questions that people are putting up, we're going to capture them, and with the, the host, we will distribute those questions to all of the panel members and ask for answers that we can then distribute to the audience, because you've all signed in. We'll put that back out through the EUSEW website, so the, answers, the questions will be answered by different panel members because of the constraints of time today. We cannot cover all the questions, but please keep your questions coming. We have them captured here. One of the first polls, which hydrogen application has the highest potential according to you, the audience? Transport or waste management or both equally, or something that's not there is maybe another. But we're in, interested to capture your thoughts. We'll leave that up for another 30 or 40 seconds and then we'll put up the second poll. We just want to capture when we have an audience. Sorry, question at the back. Yes. You're quite right. Can we change it? You have a mic. We're talking here to Can we two seconds? Application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're quite right. <laughs> I would say that was put up on purpose to see where you're awake. <laughs> 
That's what my, that's what my old teacher in school used to say when he got it wrong. <laughs> We've changed the question because you don't have time to change the online. What is the most urgent barrier for upscaling hydrogen solutions? Finance. It must be safety. Yeah. Safety. <laughs> Financing, yeah, but financing. Uh, okay, but I think. Are we really ready to go? We are ready to go. Yeah. To continue. Like if it's just Kevin's ready, we we'll go with Kevin first. Then. Yeah, they're taking their clothes off there. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, the I see Stefan, and before you uh, will take the floor after the first presentation, I want to show you this here. This is the IEA, International Energy Agency, report called The Future of Hydrogen. And that was released only last week in uh, Karusawa in Japan, uh, because Japan is at the moment um, hosting the G20 summit. They are, so to say, the leaders of the G20 at the moment. And normally, all the states that take over this role have a special issue, a special theme that, that they want to promote. And the hydrogen community um, in Europe knows very well that the ones who are even more crazy than the Dutch about hydrogen are the Japanese. They really want to create the hydrogen economy. And they ordered, so to say, at the IEA this report. If you ask me, the IEA is always, don't get me wrong, but they are always late in, um, in discovering trends. So the renewable trend they discovered quite late, to be honest. Um, at the moment, they are still on LP, or LNG, LNG, LNG. However, however, this report says there have been many attempts to make hydrogen a very, very important part of the energy system. But this time, it's for real, and it will stay. Because everybody goes for the decarbonization, which was not the issue so far. Now it is. And that's why uh, this report says built on hydrogen. I was yesterday uh, together with the, the chief economist of BP. They come up with a global economy, economy outlook on, on energy. And before he even started, he saw my name, he saw my association, said, you're the winner, hydrogen. So although it's a very fossil business, but he said, you're the winner. And he said it throughout the evening. Gave me a very good night. So let me uh, start with Angie. Another company that is extremely active in, in the field of hydrogen globally, not only in, in France or in Europe. And Eric will be the first speaker um, about the applications and methods of hydrogen. Eric, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, uh, please. Small kicker. Okay, before entering straight into the vision, just two words about Angie. Angie, it's a global company. We are 150,000 workers in the worldwide. And our motto at the moment is to be the leader in the zero carbon transition as a service. This for infrastructure, utilities, and services. Our vision, vision on hydrogen. But the vision of hydrogen is uh, to start with sweet spot. Large scale or small scale, but to start with Swiss pots, with partners which are really willing in uh, countries or uh, regions which are really willing and supportive of hydrogen, in order to develop the first application at large scale. From there, we can develop hubs, still in these willing regions, in these sweet spots for hydrogen, developing large hub, large industrial scale hub. And the last step will be to the dispatching to do a global, worldwide market. And we shouldn't forget that. This willing region, these willing partners will start these sweet spots in the hydrogen transition will be the long lasting winner. We have to keep that in mind. So, hydrogen, why hydrogen for Engie? Because we have a real large installed utility company. We are already the hands really deep in the renewable transition. But it's because not the buzzword is renewable energy. But tomorrow, the buzzword will be dispatching. Renewable energy, like already mentioned, it's, we have really bright spots, really high time for renewable energy production. Unfortunately, there is always a lot of blind spots. We have the night, and we also have the region. There is many, many regions which can produce a lot of renewable energy, but it's not always there, and mostly not there, where we can use it. 
So we need this dispatching. And it doesn't start tomorrow. It already starts today, this problem. From 30% penetration, about 30% penetration of renewable energy, like sun and wind, we have this dispatching problem, which is imminent. In California, we have it. In some spots in Europe, we already have it. So we need hydrogen or energy carrier today. Can you mess it? Oops, sorry. I went a bit fast. Possible to? Yeah, thanks. So energy projects, uh, hydrogen, like everyone knows here probably, or most of you knows, it's a very versatile energy carrier. It's used as well in energy storage for this dispatching problem, in power production, power production by, for example, fuel cell, but also gas turbine. We have a large fleet of gas turbine in NG, and it's one of our projects, and with some industrial partner to convert them to hydrogen to provide this peak power when it's needed. It's heat and cooling. You can use hydrogen for high heat, high quality, high grade heat, or also for low grade heat for municipal heating others. There is more mobility. We have this problem, large project of zero emission vehicle in France. We have this revive project that uh, our colleagues from CWEP and SWEP already spoke about today. Because we think that is one of the sweet spots, this waste to energy plant. 24 hour base load green power. That's really great for hydrogen. We have this waste to Wallonia, which is going up here. We have this Wuppertal project where NG is also a small stack. We have chemical sector. Uh, NG is invested, that's the most publicly well-known one. We have this Pilbara project with uh, our Yara partner to produce green ammonia. There was a question beforehand. Because we think it's part of the future, it's part of the future energy vector. And we have this large scale project in the north of the Netherlands. We want to install 100 megawatt of electrolysis in the northern Netherlands, uh, in Groningen region. As already mentioned, you know, this earthquake, this transition from natural gas to synthetic or biogas. We want to be there. We are there. So, my key message, shortly, briefly. One minute. Till you have one minute. Perfect. It's first, we need forward-looking authorities, forward-looking public authorities for that. We need your support. We are moving from one energy system, one stable energy system, which is fossil fuel based, to another system which is renewable, which is bright. Everyone wants to go up the hill. Everyone wants the fresh air and the nice view up there. We need the support of the public to nudge or to shove the industry that way. And it's not such a big push. We thought we spoke about billion. That's huge to do this transition. And then, just to compare, we checked how much EU is importing oil per year in cost. What we need to do this transition is a fraction of that, a fraction of one year of consumption of crude oil of Europe. Then we need large scale. Transition for PV was coming and renewable were coming because rooftop PV was really nice to launch the industry, but then we need the large scale to really boost the industry and give us a long vision. So well. Well, um, thank you very much, Eric. And did you see this fascinating slide about where renewable energy in the... Oh, that's him. That's, that's, that's the time, the clock. Um, did you see the fascinating slide that showed where the production could be and where the consumption is? It's not the same place. Um, I yesterday mentioned already one, one very, very... A uh, big example, which is the hot, hottest spot on Earth in Australia, that can produce five times as much electricity as you need globally daily. But Australia is far away. How do we get the electricity from Australia to the Netherlands? Uh, and that's the problem. And that's why electricity is one important solution, but it cannot be the only one to transport this renewable energy that we need in bulk to other regions of the world. There we are with Toyota. You said, Eric, we need forward-looking authorities. But we also need forward-looking companies. And I have to say, as a proud European, that I admire what Toyota does. Toyota is not a European. Well, they are one of the one big job supplier in Europe as well. But they are forward-looking because they were the first ones, together with Hyundai, to develop a hydrogen car that is on the market. You can buy it. You can use it. I myself have a hydrogen car. I'm happy because I can use it. It works. It simply works. It's not science fiction. And they did it, opposite to some Europeans who did not invest into this technology. And uh, 
You come back from Japan, you were there, you were witness. What's your take on the use of hydrogen in mobility? Okay. Stefan. Thank you very much, uh, Mirko. Well, my name is Stefan Herbst. I'm responsible for the hydrogen activities of uh, Toyota Motor Europe. And in the following slides, so Jorge asked me to present a little bit what is Japan doing. And essentially, we need three building blocks to make a hydrogen society going. The first is, indeed, and was mentioned, we need government, support and government strategy. So I will not go into detail, but that is the uh, hydrogen strategy that the Japanese government has published in uh, 2017 initially, looking at the supply, looking at the cost, and looking at the use especially in the mobility sector of hydrogen, going today from a fossil fuel-based hydrogen to, in the future, a complete CO2-free hydrogen. Um, where are we today? So next slide. That was one too much. <laughs> Um, the actually industry discussion already started much before we have introduced Mirai in 2015. That already started in 2011. And today, the initial target was Japan to have today 2,000 um, fuel cell cars. Already today, more than 2,800 Mirai, so our fuel cell car is on the road in Japan. And there are 113 hydrogen stations already built or, or in planning. Looking into the future before the G20, the Japanese government has revisited the original strategy and came up with this even more detailed plan, even more ambitious plan. And don't worry, I don't will go through all this, but I think presentations will be available so you can uh, have a look at the cost target. But essentially is that uh, the government has set targets for the production of hydrogen, for the transport of the hydrogen, and also for the utilization in order to create this hydrogen economy in Japan and also to stimulate that globally. The second is company leadership. And Toyota, we are committed uh, to hydrogen. We have in 2015 introduced uh, Mirai in Japan, in the United States, and in Europe. Um, since then, we further expand the utilization. So Toyota Motor Corporation is responsible for the vehicles and for the development of the stacks and uh, the tanks. Then we have partnered with the Toyota Group, uh, with Hino, produced um, this fuel cell van and uh, fuel cell bus, which will be used to 100 units for the Tokyo Olympics next year. In Europe, we partnered with Caetano. As of next year, we will introduce hydrogen buses in Europe, made in Portugal. In the United States, our colleagues have built up this Class 8 hydrogen truck, which is uh, currently being utilized and will be uh, extended in the port of LA. Then we have with the Japanese um, aerospace um, authorities um, work on, on these vehicles. Um, Toyota Industries has hydrogen forklift. So target is 500 forklift in Japan in the coming years. And Aishin, the Toyota group, is uh, producing stationary um, hydrogen applications. And we already sold 280,000 of these uh, applications in, in Japan. Having said um, that, so our way forward is we will expand the, the usage of stacks to different vehicles utilizing Toyota Group, but we will also increase the number. So today we produce 3,000 stacks per year. As of next year with the second generation, we scale this up to 30,000 stacks per year production. <coughs> Also important for us is how do we utilize, how do we introduce these vehicles in an efficient way? And this is just one example. What we want to create are hydrogen ecosystems. So this um, hydrogen uh, truck actually is being used by 7-Eleven in Japan. So we combine, again, the electricity grid, uh, including um, second life batteries with a mobility system, a forklift, and so we are looking for, for projects, actually, where we can combine and integrate hydrogen vehicles in the system. In Europe, it was mentioned we, have, we will have, as of next year, 600 um, Mirai in the taxi fleet in, in Paris. In the United States, we're building up more trucks for the harbor of, of LA. So we are looking for this kind of fleet for big trucks and, and passenger vehicles to build up this ecosystem and then to expand from from there. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 30. <laughs> um, 
creating a hydrogen global ecosystem, and it was mentioned um, today as part of the roadmap, and you need to shift uh, your, your view. So Japan here is in the center. Um, actually, the first project as of next year, Japan will start introducing hydrogen produced in Australia, including a CCS. So Kawasaki is currently building up the, the ships. Actually, I saw the virtual tour last week. And you might say, my, of course, that is just the start to get a global hydrogen market going. And uh, to give you magnitude, the target of this project is to have hydrogen at three, for three euros at a port in Japan and to scale this up to 300,000 tons per year. Also, you mentioned Middle East. Middle East, uh, there are current discussions, so starting from Australia next year, and then focus also on, on the Middle East to produce um, very cheap renewable elect, um, hydrogen that can be then uh, transported. And the IEA actually also mentioned about two euro are possible to produce renewable hydrogen, especially in the Middle East and even below, as the example you showed. So I will just um, stop with a quote from, uh, from our chairman that you really can see. So Toyota is committed and passionate to make a hydrogen ecosystem and hydrogen society work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we now have to turn very quickly to uh, our last pres presentations. Rory, yeah. are you, you do a joint presentation. We're doing Super. Half presentation each. Okay, yes. so uh, it's five minutes for both of you, yeah. <laughs> Rory and Kevin. Yeah. Who Kevin, wants to start? Kevin first. Kevin first. long we are waiting, uh, mm -hmm. where are the women? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> uh, one of the most fascinating women uh, in uh, energy sitting here is Eva, Eva Henning from, she represents Eurogas and the DSOs, so she is excellent. So she's, when I have an issue with technical questions, I ask a woman and not a man, it's her. <laughs> Uh, my president is a woman, but she's not available today. The president of Hydrogen Europe is a lady. Um, and also, your president, Eric, your CEO is uh, Isabel Cocher, uh, is also a lady. So there are a lot of ladies, very active, but it's not a closed shop. You are invited. Look at these handsome men here. So you are invited. Be more ladies in, in, in hydrogen. We need you. That's my answer to this question from Nana. It's an important question. Okay, uh, so Paul already introduced uh, about my PhD in, into green ammonia, but also the uh, decision support tool that we are developing. Uh, these are based on, uh, on three pilot plans. We use uh, data from them uh, to validate our models and um, use them for our website. So it's all started with those pilot plants. The first one is in Northern Ireland, where they use a 500 kilowatt uh, electrolyzer coupled to a wind park. Uh, another um, pilot plant is in Saarbrücken, uh, which uses a 35 kilowatt electrolyzer um, uh, coupled with solar panels. Then um, we already funded uh, there is a f funding has been secured for three hydrogen buses in Belfast and uh, one fuel cell uh, car in Saarbrücken. These buses uh, in Belfast are built in Northern Ireland. So Gencom already um, accomplished the a, a pilot plant in uh, Northern in, in Scotland, uh, which uses uh, an electrolyzer from uh, fish waste and also uses the oxygen for uh, producing the fish itself. So more will be talked about uh, about DST for Rory. Okay. Thank you very much, Kevin. So, so this is this is all part of the GenCom project, which is as Paul introduced in the first session this morning, is a uh, ten partner, five country. 9 million euro project funded by Interreg Northwest Europe. And the idea is to build and prove three pilot plants for hydrogen, for renewable hydrogen production, in the first instance using only curtailed electricity. Um, and, uh, and then what we are doing, uh, the full final deliverable of GenCom, 
is this uh, decision support tool. And the decision support tool can be used by anyone in the first instance within Northwest Europe that's planning renewable hydrogen investments. And here's how it works. So we are amassing a data library of annual energy demand um, uh, for, for all of the potential uses for hydrogen. I'll show an example of this in a moment for, for uh, bus mobility. We can work out the hydrogen equivalent, we can work out a hydrogen demand. On the supply side, we're again assembling a large database of all of the curtailed wind energy available at every wind farm across Europe. We are optimizing electrolyzer sizings for each of those wind farms, coming up with a hydrogen supply. And then what the decision support tool does is um, connects the supply chain, connects the supply chain and develops costs. So in the probably one minute I have left, I'll show an example. This is, the, uh, this, is, this is a case study that we've done. This is what we call our transnational case study. If you would like, uh, there's an extended version of these slides uh, that, that we can make available. We've got case studies at local, regional, and this transnational level. And in this, we're trying to answer the question, if we used curtailed energy only, how much of Europe's major city bus fleets could we run from that hydrogen? So this is showing the, the 40 largest cities in, again, Northwest Europe. We're not trying to be exclusive here. It's just this is where our funding comes from. <laughs> and um, so you can see some cities here getting over three quarters of their bus uh, transportation fuel could be supplied by hydrogen. I'm coming to you from Ireland, so I'm going to show the example for Dublin. Now, please don't be alarmed at the costs of these. This is curtailed hydrogen only, okay? So one thing we need to bear in mind with curtailed hydrogen only is our electrolyzers have very low capacity factors. In Ireland, we get a wind capacity factor of maybe 35, 38%, quite high. Our curtailment rate is currently six or 7%. So that gives you an idea. The, 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 the sizing of the electrolyzer is very important and also finding, ele finding electricity, green electricity, to keep the electrolyzer going when it's not operating on curtailed only is going to be very, very important. So that's where the next steps of GenCom are going. We realize that these costs are high, so there's work to do in coming up with systems like the Mainz system of deciding when the electrolyzer operates, when is the best, uh, what's the best decision to make in real-time operation. So uh, that's it, thank you. Thanks very much. This concludes also the last panel, and I was quite amazed to see Saarbrücken. I'm from Saarbrücken, and it was exactly my car, but not my number plate. I was the first one to go to the authorities with this car, hydrogen car. It took me four hours to get the number plates. They didn't know what <laughs> hydrogen is, and so there's already one car in Saarbrücken. At the moment, it's in, it's in Brussels. Thanks very much. Now, I need your help to... Um, elaborate on, on the questions uh, or to, because we don't have that much of time. No. Uh, no time anymore? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Super. Right. So let us run through the questions. Uh, the first one has been answered, I think, but the second one to Ella is waste that, power plant. That was from the, the previous presentation. Uh, is that a little bit flex, more flexible than uh, the electricity production? Mm -hmm. Would you want to answer? Yeah. yeah? You can come here. Uh, I can already try to answer, uh, or not to answer, the third question. What is the overcost of the insulated tube? You saw this white thing uh, compared with the standard polyethylene. I don't know. It's quite new technology. It's, uh, uh, we have to ask. The producer was on it, so please ask them. I think the market did not really develop. Saudi Aramco has bought a first big chunk. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. I can be very brief on it if there's flexibility in waste to energy plants to produce electricity. Well, if you have space to store the waste in front of the waste to energy plant, you have some uh, flexibility. But don't forget, an important task of waste to energy is, is a hygienic task and a sanitary task. You have to treat the dirty rest, the dirty waste, which is not good enough for recycling. And for hygienic reasons, you thermally need to treat it. So. Of course, there are nice energy aspects that waste energy produces energy, but an important task is the sanitary one. So, thank you very much. Uh, we are going up to the other questions. What is needed for Red Stack to start up the first 
of a kind project. That's Peter. He's here. Yeah. You can give him the, the micro. What and next question would be what's the overall efficiency of yeah, green hydrogen? Yep, our uh, three quarter of a megawatt uh, plant will be a demo, which is bigger than a pilot, but smaller than a commercial one. I think we uh, will be competitive in kilowatt hour oh, prices uh, once we're above 25 megawatt per plant. So a three quarter of a megawatt is uh, not going to work from an economic point of view. Um, we will need some uh, 30 million capex extra that cannot be paid off uh, by uh, the electricity we're going to sell uh, out of this plant. And that's what we are talking about with the Dutch government at the moment, how to arrange that part of the finance. Excellent. Next question on the efficiency. Uh, he, what is the overall efficiency, energy efficiency of green hydrogen of the supply chain if hydrogen is stored at 100 bar and above? Rory, you want to answer yeah, this? Yeah, so it's, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a, a definitive number on this, but the, but the efficiency of the electrolyzer systems that we're looking at, is at it is, is about 70%. Um, there are some further losses with the uh, with the with the compression, but the major energy consumption is the is the electrolyzer. Then, you know, if we're just if our if our system ends at the production of hydrogen, then that's 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 our figure. Excellent. What is the overall F energy efficiency? Yeah, that green ammonia, green. Hydrogen can be used for producing green ammonia and decarbonize the fertilizers. Do you know price difference between green ammonia and conventional ammonia? You? Or you, Kevin? Um, Same as uh, uh, hydrogen, green and Yes. Yeah. I know that you have to add 10%. But you say it's the same. It's absolutely the same. Yeah, okay. Fine. Related. So it's near similar. But that's the question. If you provide... Uh, if you provide grid balance and service, how can you demonstrate that produced hydrogen is green? Certificates, guarantees of origin, and a combination of both. <laughs> and we are working on that. So it's not existing at the moment. We have an excellent uh, project which is called Certif High, which goes very much into detail of that. And we are, Antonio had to leave, we are working with the Commission uh, on making this a standard. This or and simplified version. I think we went through all the questions. Most important question. What's about the the poll? The wrap up. The wrap up and the, mm. the poll you wanna Yeah. Okay, so I give the floor back to Frank. Yeah, I have a microphone here. Um, we start with the polls, I think they were announced on the screens. Uh, we will have to find a way that uh, some questions were not answered from Slido, maybe they can be answered um, by the speakers at a later stage, but we will investigate it. Um, yes, I think, thank you very much. So we've um, come to the end of this session. Uh, we'd just like to thank uh, our co-organizers our co-organizers uh, for the session, uh, SWET, Hydrogen Mobility Europe, uh, of course the joint undertaking, um, the European Commission and others, which I hope I do not forget at this moment. Um, and then I would like to thank uh, in name uh, Karen from uh, European um, uh, Sustainable Energy Week Organization Commission and also uh, Simon Dichman, my colleague, uh, who did a large part of the work actually uh, chasing people uh, and also organizing that slide that was possible in uh, this session. And of course I would like to have an applause for all the speakers and the uh, discussants uh, who um, were active in participation of this meeting. Yeah. Thank you very much.